and welcome to our inaugural lecture of the Ole Talk series organized by the research group Literature, Art and Performance from the University of Valencia in Spain. In this Ole Talk series, we will be welcoming some of the best scholars and we will be sharing with you their fascinating research and knowledge with the aim of promoting and disseminating knowledge about current developments on the research lines of the group. We hope you enjoy them. In this video, the director of the research group, Dr. Laura Monroz Gaspar, will be welcoming Professor Maria Jesus Lorenzo Modia from the University of A Coruña in Spain. Professor Lorenzo Modia's talk about your chariot in Spain was celebrated on the occasion of the seminar Literary and Cultural Productions, Agents and Objects, hosted by a research group at the University of Valencia. After Professor, Professor Lorenzo's talk, you will also be able to see the Q&A exchange. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Monroz Gaspar and Professor Lorenzo Modia. Thank you very much for watching. It's a great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Lorenzo Modia. Maria Jesus Lorenzo Modia is full professor of English literature at the University of A Coruña. Her main research interests are modern and contemporary literature about women, and her, uh, her last publications are the reception of George Eliot in Spain, in the reception of George Eliot in Europe, in Bloomsbury in 2015, and her own edited volume in collaboration with Margarita Esteve, uh, which is entitled The Ethics and Aesthetics of Echo Caring, Contemporary Debates on Echo Feminism, which was published in Rutledge in 2019. Uh, the title of her talk today is George Eliot in Spain, the Spanish Gypsy, and we hope that you enjoy it uh, greatly. Thank you very much, and Maria Jesus, welcome. The floor is yours. Good morning to all of you. I want to thank Dr. Laura Monroz, her research group, and the University of Valencia for having invited me to speak in this seminar on literature and culture productions, agents and objects. I will be speaking of an author who lived in the 19th century and who is still an agent speaking to us by means of our texts, by means of literary objects. My idea today is to introduce the author to analyze how her works reached us and how some of them may not have been so well known. In particular, uh, the one entitled The Spanish Gypsy, a poem. George Eliot, uh, as you know, is the pseudonym of the woman writer Mary Ann Evans, born in the United Kingdom in 1819 uh, and who passed away in 1880. She is one of the great English writers and according to Virginia Woolf, I have <coughs> a PowerPoint that I may uh, share with you, right? Yes, and here we have uh, Marianne Evans, right? According to Virginia Woolf, one of her works, uh, Middlemarch, a study of provincial life, published in the years 1871 uh, 72, is, I quote, a magnificent book which with all its imperfections, is one of the few English novels written for grown-up people." End of quote. As you may uh, be aware of, she was producing her works during uh, high Victor Victorianism and started her literary career in the 1840s and 1850s as a translator of the German philosophers David Strauss, Ludwig Feuerbach. She also translated the book Ethics, written by the Safadi Spanish author Baro Espinosa. She was also a literary critic who contributed essays to relevant journals in London, such as the Westminster Review or even Blackwood's magazine. She also wrote laudatory reviews for the feminist writers Mary Wollstonecraft and Mar Margaret Fuller in The Leader in uh, October 1855, 
Although not a militant uh, feminist activist, she was a friend of Barbara Bodichon, editor of English Women's Journal, and supported her campaign in favor of the right of married uh, women to roll their own money. Elliot collaborated also with the foundation of the first college for women at Cambridge, Gatton College. These are just some details of the life of an intellectually active um, uh, writer, woman of her time. She is widely known for her novels, besides Middlemarch, her best known works are um, Adam Bede, The Mill on the Floor, Silas Marner, Romola, Felix Holt, The Radical, or uh, Daniel Deronda. Um, her literary production includes also essays on John Ruskin, published in the Westminster Review, on rationalism, or on classical Greek philosophers, for instance, the book Impressions of Theophrastus Satch in 1879. She wrote as well short stories and poetry, although these are lesser known by members of the public. And the work, entitled The Spanish Gypsy, is a long poem written in blank verse, which shares features both with drama and the novel. As from 1854, the writer had a personal and intellectual relationship with George Henry Lewis, psychologist, philosopher and critic. And this relationship never ended in a marital bound since Lewis was already married to Agnes Jervis. Elliot's union uh, with Lewis would last until the death of her partner. Consequently, she would be socially isolated and was not invited to events, either public or private. In order to diminish this ostracism punishment, they traveled to many European countries, usually incognito, so that she would not be troubled. Being a woman was a problem, as you can see, both for personal and literary lives. Fully conscious of it, the female writer used a pen name for which she is known nowadays, not only respecting her desire, but also showing clearly the moral double standard suffered by women writers who have to publish anonymously or use male nom de plume, for instance, Georges Sand in France or Fernand Caballero in Spain. As contemporaries of Charles Darwin, both Eliot and Lewis were making experiments in natural history and they incorporated the evolutionist theories and their relationship with the material world to their respective works. Their texts are about the great political, religious and moral issues of the 19th century and arguably of our own time. Additionally, as had occurred historically with, for instance, Lord Holland, Robert Southey, Lord Byron, and with many others, in the United Kingdom, there was a great curiosity regarding the Spanish culture, particularly concerning the works of uh, the medieval periods and those of the golden age. Uh, George Henry Lewis had already issued a book on Spanish drama in 1846 entitled The Spanish Drama, uh, Lope de Vega and Calderon. <clears throat> and Elliot, on her part, was looking for inspiration in Spanish culture and painting for her work, in particular for The Spanish Gypsy, that would be published in 1868, three years after their visit to the Spanish Peninsula. 
The Spanish language was learnt and spoken by the educated elites in England and Lewis and Elliot were no exception in this. She admired Saint Teresa of Avila, as can be seen in the preface to Middlemarch, and whose work, Libro de la Vida, Elliot had tried to buy in a bookshop in the city of Zaragoza. In Elliot's texts, there are many references to Spanish culture, among them an untranslated fragment of Las Siete Partidas by the Spanish king Alfonso the Wise, that appears in the Spanish Gypsy. Although the declared purpose in coming to Spain was Lewis's health, they had a genuine interest for the country since both published works about Spanish topics. In Spain, they visited many cities from San Sebastián on their way to the Mediterranean via Zaragoza towards Andalusia and coming back through Madrid where, for instance, they visited um, the Escorial, right? Elliot was fascinated by um, Spanish art. In Seville, she admired paintings by Murillo. And in Granada, she was particularly interested in the Albaicín Quarter, where she went to on several occasions in order to talk to and enjoy the singing by the gypsies there in a sort of cultural uh, immersion. Um, when the Spanish Gypsy was published, it was widely acclaimed and issued successfully in the English speaking world. As an example, it should be taken into account that six editions were given to light between the years 1868 and 1876, and that the novelist and critic Henry James uh, wrote a positive review of it in the North American Review in the year of publication, indicating that the poem had, and I quote, extraordinary rhetorical energy and eloquence, end of quote. In the Hispanic world, nothing similar happened. It was only in the year uh, 2019, while commemorating the bicentenary of the birth of George Eliot, when the first Spanish edition became known, translated as La Gitanilla Española, Poema Dramatico, by Maria Dona Petri from Oxford University. I was the editor and author of the introduction, and it was published by the University of Valladolid. The fact that this book is by such a great writer and that it has a, a Spanish theme would justify in itself disseminating it. However, my contention is that this text is particularly relevant nowadays since it deals with issues of gender, ethnicity and post-colonialism that are still particularly relevant in the present day. Therefore, the methodology used for this presentation is intersectional and includes post-colonial studies, as explored by Edward Said, Omi Baba, uh, the concept of hybridity by Baba in the location of culture, as well as reception studies as explicated by Jaws, Roman in Garden, uh, Wolfram Acer, Tompkins, etc., and gender studies, um, and I mentioned here simply Elaine Shaw Walter and Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar. Um, the Spanish Gypsy is um, a title already known in England since it had been given to a tragic comedy by Thomas Middleton, Decker, William Rowley and John Ford published in the 17th century and based upon two exemplary novels by Miguel de Cervantes, La Gitanilla and La Fuerza de la Sangre. Since Eliot's The Spanish Gypsy is set in the 15th century, its title may try to ring a bell of past centuries. 
La Gitanilla by Cervantes had already been translated into English as The Little Gypsy Girl uh, in 1822 and was a text well known by the Victorian author. In their travels, both Eliot and Lewis were interested in the history, art, culture and intellectual activities in the places they visited. For instance, her novel Romola, published in 1863, deals with the reunification of Italy and its difficulties and consequences. That visit to Spain is an intellectual journey to the south, to the land of different, different cultures, which included Jews, Arabs, Christians and Gypsies. We can read in their letters that during their trips in England in uh, 1864, the couple was already using Don Quixote in Spanish to improve their proficiency in the language and to prepare their Spanish uh, adventure. In their epistolary texts, they also speak in a humorous way of their fits of Spanish history, end of quote. And one must also bear in mind that there were many books on um, Spanish topics uh, published in the UK of which Eliot would be aware. Some of them uh, were uh, uh, Washington Irving's um, The Alhambra, uh, a series of tales and sketches of the Moors and Spaniards, 1832, 32, George Bernard Deppin's edition of uh, Romancero Castellano, 1844, by the same author, The History of Jews in the Medieval Period, Les Juifs dans le Moyen Âge, or Butterworth's translation of Cervantes' farce El Juez de los Divorcios uh, into German, a language in which Eliot was proficient. We also know that Richard Ford's A Handbook of Travellers in Spain and Readers at Home, published in London in 1845 with many subsequent editions, was a book that uh, uh, Eliot followed as a travel guide. We can also read in her correspondence that she used to read histories of the Iberian Peninsula, such as the one published in London by William Prescott, History of the Reign of Ferdinand and Isabella the Catholic of Spain, 1842, or that by um, Eliakim Kaumoli, published in Brussels, 1844, Histoire de Médecine Juive Ancienne et Moderne, where one can read how the Jew doctors had to abandon the Spanish land after the expulsion uh, decree. Eliot's letters also attested that she was reading Ernest Renan's Averroes and Averroism. No, I'm sorry, it is in French, Averroes, uh, uh, Averroism. All these texts show that Eliot was intellectually avid and alert in all things Spanish. And a good example of it is a comment of one of, on one of her letters regarding an imprecision in Henry Blackburn's Travel in Spain in the present day, published in London in the same year of the journey to Iberia, 1866. One of the relevant uh, ethnic groups in Spain for many foreign visitors was that formed by Sincalis Gypsies. This group of population had reached the peninsula in the 15th century, exactly in the year 1425, when King Alfonso of Aragon and Valencia, the magnanimous, authorized their entrance into the country together with Peter II of Castile. In the early stages of their migration, they were known as Egyptians to the, to, due to their late uh, place of origin, Egypt Minor. 
that was the name at the time for present day Turkey. Yet in 1492, they were included in the decree of expulsion. There were new expulsion decrees for gypsies in 1612 and in 1749 by the Marquis of Ensenada, for instance. However, it is to be noted that in some northern European countries, there existed a passion for Spain that was particularly connected with these travellers. Eliot considered gypsies, and I quote, the genuine Spanish life. End of quote. The existence of this nostalgic look on Spain can be attested by works such as uh, Alain René Lesage, Le Gil Blas de Santillana, inspired in Spanish uh, picaresque texts that Elias and Lewis bought in Zaragoza and were reading, or perhaps rereading, on their way through Spain. Other works based on Spanish myths are Lord Byron's Don Juan, inspired in the medieval legend, or Carmen by Prosper Merrime. There are many English texts on gypsies. I will mention only those that you have here by George Borrow, uh, the Sincale. Uh, he was a merchant of evangelical Bibles. In the Galician press, he was known as Jorgito el Inglés. But he wrote the Bible in Spain uh, and he published several works to disseminate gypsy culture. For instance, Evangelio de San Lucas en Caló, 1837, The Sincali, an account of the gypsies in Spain, and even a novel entitled Lavrengo, the scholar, the gypsy, the priest. Eliot uh, had already shown in print her interest in gypsies. This ethnic group had been represented previously in her works, both in Janet's uh, Repentance, which is a section of scenes of clerical life, uh, and in the middle of the floss when uh, uh, young Maggie Tulliver decides to join the travellers since she had often been told to be like them. Okay, uh, as mentioned before, Eliot shares uh, her interest in gypsies with uh, many other European uh, intellectuals. Many of these texts present a medievalized vision of the country, even in the 19th century. For instance, in Mary May's uh, Carmen. Others reflect the various cultures um, in Spain in stereotypes that represent an idealized uh, version of, of reality. This foreign uh, fascination uh, for gypsies indicates that they were being used as a trope in the 19th century, as can be seen in the following recent studies. You know, you have here four different books, uh, contemporary uh, studies, and their titles are self-explanatory. The History of European Obsession, the Gypsy as a Trope, Gypsies and the British Imagination, the Spanish Craze, Americans Fascination, etc. Okay, right. George Eliot shared this tendency, this fascination, um, and explores his Spanish, uh, Hispanic history, its different cultures and literatures through the character of a marginalized young girl who incarnates the values of her ancestral culture that others do not value. It is well known that Eliot presents female heroines in her novels who have groundbreaking innovative features and who challenge the surrounding uh, world. Good examples of it are Maggie Tulliver in The Mill on the Floss, 
Dorothea Brooke in Middle March, or Princess Harm Eberstein, Daniel Deronda's mother in the eponymous uh, novel, who disobeys her father in order to be free and have a successful life as an opera singer. The same happens in the case of Fadalma in The Spanish Gypsy. She valiantly accepts a great personal sacrifice confronting conventionalisms that did not allow inter-ethnic relationships, particularly in the case of women, and especially if they are poor. The work analyzes the relations with the other and how the different ethnic groups are ghettoized without ever considering their positive values. It seems clear that the minoritized ethnic groups such as Jews and Arabs were being prosecuted by the Spanish Inquisition, while gypsies were not among the priorities of the Holy Office, since they believed that no benefits could be derived either from their richness or their knowledge. Eliot's uh, text presents us with a woman at a crossroads where different cultures and ethnicities meet in 15th century Spain. This is a world who would have new frontiers very soon in America, but who does not admit otherness and where the promised land would not be America yet, but Africa. The Spanish Gypsy is a dramatic poem in blank verse set in the south of Spain before the conquest of Granada by the King of Aragon and the Queen of Castile. In the poem, there can be seen the fierce fights between the Arabs and the Christians. At the same time, it can be perceived the subsidiary role that the Sincales and the Jews had in Spanish uh, society before the capitulations of Santa Fe. The protagonist, Fincali Fadalma, has been brought up and educated by a Catholic family and she falls in love with the Duke of Silva. Infatuated by the beauty of his jewels, his social position, which she would eventually share. She envisions herself as an empowered woman representing not only a 15th century heroine, but also a contemporary woman who aspires to have an inter-ethnic and inter-class and conventional marriage. In the poem, Fadalma is given the name Lady Fadalma by the people, but she is also described as representing darkness since she is not a follower of the Catholic Church and her prospective marriage will be one between, and I quote, light and obscurity. Obviously, this marriage is not welcome by the Inquisition, represented by a Dominican friar called Isidore, who opposes a possible bone between a nobleman and a gypsy. The heroine, Fidelma, is a character who has brought up, who has been brought up in a Catholic community and who turns out to be an adopted child belonging originally to the gypsy nomads. She is in love with a powerful Catholic Hidalgo and expects to have an unconventional inter-ethnic marriage. The year 1492, in which the poem is approximately set, marked a turning point since, on the one hand, various ethnic groups were expelled from the peninsula in an attempt at ethnic cleansing by sending all these peoples to the diaspora, and on the other, a uh, centralization of power is started after the reconquering of the whole territory of Spain. Eliot was concerned with all the marginalized groups. Her interest in Judaism is pervasive in her texts. 
and it reappears when in 1866 she meets in the British Library Emmanuel Deutsch while composing the Spanish Gypsy. As editor herself of the Quarterly Review, she had a strong intellectual and professional connection with this librarian and her interest in Judaica appears in the poem, to the point that the Jewish uh, sources of the Spanish Gypsy are still object of study uh, nowadays. Elliot's uh, knowledge of the historic situation of the Spanish Jews may be proven by one of the end notes to the text in which she explains the use of the word of the term marranos uh, which is referring to the spanish jews in book one of the poem she explains that the, the lofty derivation from marantha that means uh, in hebrew the lord comes is changed into Marrano, which is, as we know, the Spanish word for, for pig. And then the old Christians they were using this derogatory term for the new Christians or uh, converted uh, Jews, right? The book depicts in a dramatic way the situation of uh, some of the Jews forced to convert into Catholicism, conversos, but who remain Jews at heart. One of the examples is the host who must hide his real beliefs in order to save his life. And I quote, a warranted Christian, else how to keep an inn, which calling asks true faith, end of quote. Obviously, he had to say that he was a Christian, but otherwise he couldn't um, earn his his life there's another jew character in the poem safado a servant in the household of the hero don silva who declares his uh, true identity uh, it's true at least i am no catholic but salomo safado a born jew willing to serve Don uh, Silva. Uh, Safado's family name, as you can see, alludes to the Spanish and Portuguese Jews who had come to the Iberian Peninsula from Northern Africa. Sepharad being the name for Spain in Hebrew. Okay? Safado, like his lord, will suffer the invectives of Father Isidore, the Inquisition Dominican friar. Okay, and in the end, Don Silva will have to abandon the country and go to diaspora like Jews and gypsies, but in a solitary journey to the Catholic haven of Rome, since his intended mixed marriage was socially rejected both by the Inquisition Catholic authorities and by gypsies. Um, Jews had been present in the Hispanic Peninsula from antiquity and they had a very powerful community in medieval Spain, both under Muslim and Catholic uh, rule. The Catholic aristocrat Don Silva has a profound debate when deciding to abandon his comfortable life and follow an uncertain, difficult path with the gypsies, since love was his motto. However, once there, he feels that he must abandon his noble love adventure, since his new group rejects him. His tragedy is that having joined the enemy out of love, and having accidentally killed the heroine's father, his original people will not accept him back, okay? Thus, Don Silva represents the will of integration in another culture, but the turbulent world they live in makes it impossible. 
Meanwhile, the poem reflects the situation of Christopher Columbus trying to persuade the monarchs to subsidize uh, his voyage to the Indies. Right? Eliot is conscious, conscious of the economic differences among social strata. And in the poem, the poor characters are the ones who anticipate and suffer the problems more intensely. And the discrimination of various ethnic groups is clearly uh, depicted as occurs with the character of Blasco. He says, you know, we cannot all be Goths of Aragon. Uh, he says, Jews are not fit for, for heaven, but on earth they are most useful. It is the same with mules, horses or oxen, or with any pig, except St. Anthony's. They are useful here, the Jews I mean, though they may go to hell. And look you, useful sins, though they may go to hell. Sorry, and look you, useful sins, why providence sends Jews to them, saving Christian souls. He's being ironic here, you know, the Jews are the ones who have all the sins and then the Christians can go to heaven and, and the, the Jews go to hell, right? Um, Eliot is not only interested in Jews, but also in the Sinkali. And she is also concerned with the double discrimination suffered by women belonging to these minorities. Eliot depicts very clearly the subservient, even animal roles played by members of these ethnic groups uh, in the social scale. For instance, she says, the very gypsies curved and harnessed well. I mean, they are being used as animals. The text by Eliot is set as at the end of the uh, Reconquest War, which brought about a civilian conflict among the, the different peoples who lived before in an unstable political situation in the peninsula, this dramatic poem uh, problematizes um, the coexistence of the different ethnic groups by means of a mixed love story and adds a powerful gender issue to the, to the story. In the end, the gypsy leader for Dalma abandons her fiancé because she is persuaded that she would be rejected um, out of uh, uh, intolerance uh, by both uh, uh, gypsies and Catholics and considered only as a central figure by the latter. She prefers to lead her people forced to wander about in diaspora like Jews, but probably in a poorer economic situation and with her father about to pass away. They also declare that they have an ancient faith and cohesion as a group. And consequently, duty and freedom is tragically preferred by the heroine to the detriment of love. In the poem, uh, uh, gypsies even consider Jews their friends since they are also expelled by the Spaniards. Zarka, Fadalma's father, is well aware of the fact that they are considered as others. You can see it here, men of Badnar, well-wishers and allies, whether of Moorish or of Hebrew blood, who, being galled by the hard Spaniard's yoke, have welcomed our quick conquest as release. I, Zarka, the Sinkalo chieftain, 
hold by delegation of the Moorish king, supreme command with his town and fort. You see, there are uh, speeches by the Sinkhalos uh, uh, with an alliance uh, between the uh, Moors, the Hebrews, and the Gypsies, right? Um, in conclusion, as can be seen in this work, George Eliot emphasized the contradictions extant in Spain regarding ethnic uh, minorities. Moreover, she wrote from a dual position. On the one hand, that of a 19th century writer addressing her contemporary English readership, and on the other, being as faithful as possible to the 15th century history in a country who would make possible a global empire. Thus, this text problematizes not only matters of gender, migration, racism, and multiculturalism in the Iberian Peninsula during the fight for the reunification of Spain, or in 19th century Britain, for that matter, but also addressed 21st century readers since these issues are still debated nowadays. The Spanish Gypsy is a hybrid text, both from the formal and from the contact point of view. Formally, it shares features of narratives, ballads, and drama. From the thematic perspective, it explores a hybrid possibility of coexistence of, coexistence of different communities beyond ethnic and religious persecutions. Metaphorically, it deals with the acceptance of positive values in the other, or else, Tragedy is the only way out of the situation. Eliot valiantly confronts conventionalism that impede women from having inter-ethnic relationships. And I quote, we women are not dealt with, which is um, a quote that appears in the Spanish Gypsy. Césped uh, Alma, particularly if they are poor. Professor Eleanor Schaffer uh, from the British Academy has recently said that George Eliot was not only speaking to 19th century readers, but to all of us who may not be aware of what a multicultural society should be. In this text, Eliot advocates the peaceful belonging of characters to coexisting different creeds. But as a 19th century writer, she cannot foresee it possible as possible. However, the mere presentation of these issues is a great step for women in multicultural societies. Thank you. I mean, I was in, meanwhile, they think about the questions or they write the questions. I was uh, in a colloquium in, uh, in Oxford uh, some years ago and um, um, I was, we were uh, working on the, um, the reception of George Eliot in different countries. And when I was um, speaking about Eliot in Spain, I mentioned that most of uh, her works uh, had not been translated into Spanish, particularly the Spanish Gypsy. The Spanish Gypsy. And then that's why I, I thought that this work was interesting and uh, that we had to uh, attempt the, this task. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it because it is a book 
about us that uh, we have not read, uh, presumably, and that we were not uh, aware of. Mm -hmm. I am aware that she went, uh, while in Spain, she went to see all the place by, by anyone in Spain that were being acted in the cities in which they were at the time, because we have that in the in the letters. We know uh, that she the, the works that she was reading because uh, we we have references of that as well. And concerning uh, the gypsies in particular, she went to the Albaicín um, in on various occasions for performances because she asked them uh, to perform for for her and and for Louis who was accompanying her and um, she wanted not only to talk to them but to enjoy uh, the, the the dancing and the, in the Sacramonte as we know and to to have interviews with the um, with the Sincalis. I could mention also that uh, she is very careful to use the word Sincalo, Sincalis, etc., uh, which is the, the, the cultivated term and not the derogatory one that she thought gypsy. However, since Gypsy was probably better known, um, the, the book was pub published as uh, the Spanish Gypsy and not with the word Thinkali. I'm not mm, fully aware uh, how uh, to follow your pattern, how this uh, literary object came to light uh, with the term gypsy, because it may be a decision uh, which did not uh, come from Eliot, at least, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I'm, I cannot say that um, firmly just now. Mm -hmm. The thing is that in the um, in this work uh, we have a young girl um, who is in love with a young man, a young boy, right? Um, it seems uh, at the beginning we don't know that the girl is a gypsy. The girl has been educated so to speak, in the Catholic quarter by a Catholic family. But uh, it so happens that um, there are people who are dubious about her origin. Uh, you know, gossiping, saying mm, maybe she is not a full Catholic. She has not pure blood. She is not completely one of us. And then this is something that may be heard, as um, Eliot puts it, may be heard in the neighborhood, but which is uh, something of a witch chase that is being um, carried out by the um, Inquisition at the time in Spain. Then, on the one hand, Eliot places the problem in 15th century Spain, but she's speaking to 19th century readers who have gypsies in England and who have uh, Jews in England and who have people coming from different places in England, even from India. 
where originally the gypsies come from then then she is presenting the problem as contemporary or at least she is mm, telling her victorian readers what about this okay we have suffered that in the south in southern spain or in spain and what about us and it is something that we can read even from our perspective because you know the communication process is not complete until we read the book and we may read the book 200 years later okay and then we as readers say look what about us because this is happening here to what extent this is what we are doing or not doing um, thank you uh, look i will start with a title uh, that's why when we uh, presented this new edition uh, paying homage to Cervantes, that's why we decided to use La Gitanilla Española and not La Gitana Española or La Finca La Española, right? Then, yes, probably you are right and she was fully conscious of, uh, fully aware of, and, and she was a reader of Cervantes' work. Yes, I, I would support that. Was she aware of Borrow's work? I would say yes. And I think that she read and um, George Borrow's texts. I, I would say yes. I don't have with me just now probably the reference, but I'm sure uh, she would. Borrow um, uh, was um, a famous character in, in London and, and she was not allowed into uh, the London circles, but she had all the information via Lewis, right? Concerning the language, uh, yes, she, she uses uh, this uh, romanticized language, but she uses sort of different registers. I didn't have time to talk about that. Uh, when the, the Jews are singing or when the, the gypsies speak or when other people speak and they have different registers and she, even different forms. And um, yes, I think that she is um, aware of the language or she's trying to represent in a certain way the different languages of the different uh, social strata and social group now concerning the heroine yes that's the, what happens she is uh, true to herself she has to, to go through a long way because at the beginning she is infatuated by the Duke, by Don Silva, and, and by the position, etc. But uh, she suffers a long process of realizing who um, she is and uh, becoming the leader of the Sinkali, the, the leader of the, of the group because her father is about to die and they need a leader. And then uh, it's very important that we have a lady being the leader. But um, this is a tragic decision because obviously she has to choose between love and her moral duty. And ladies, uh, women cannot have everything, right? And they have to choose. In the, in the 19th century, 
that's why I said that uh, Elliot uh, thinks that women cannot have everything, but at least she presents the problem so that they can uh, follow a path to be happy and to have love and be true to their identity. Then, yes, true to herself, but uh, with a tragic uh, life, in a way. Thank you so much, uh, Maria Jesus. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lorenzo Modia, for such a wonderful and inspiring talk. And I'm sure that he's raised lots of uh, topics to think about. Uh